Very good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We have a very respectable 42 people and actually they're coming in thick and fast still. I'll just try and keep tabs on, on that. But I think we should start because as some of you may know, there's another uh, very interesting event on a related subject taking place at 6.30. So uh, we will work together, I think, very well. Um, Good. Um, so, as some of you will know, this event, this talk by Alan Powers, is part of a bigger program of online events um, organised under the auspices of the Insiders Outsiders Festival, which, um, as a project, aims to pay tribute and to analyse in more nuanced sorts of ways the very rich and wide ranging and pervasive contribution of refugees from Nazi Europe to this country's culture. We've had sessions on music, on literature, one on architecture, uh, there's much more to come lasting until Sunday this week, in fact. Uh, but today, Alan will be talking about the Bauhaus, less familiar aspects of the Bauhaus, and the second event will be looking at a much less known phenomenon, namely the Riemann School of Art and Design, which came to London also as a result of the rise of fascism. So let me first of all introduce Alan. I suspect he's well known to many of you as a, a writer and also as a, a lecturer, but he's a London-based uh, teacher and writer and curator, writing mostly or concentrating mostly on mid 20th century British art, architecture and design, very wide ranging in his interests and expertise. Um, I like the way you put it, Alan, you said, I think in one of the sources I found online, that painting, drawing and printmaking are an occasional indulgence, and he is actually very good at those, uh, those activities as well. He's the author of numerous uh, publications, numerous books, uh, among them surveys of modern uh, 20th century modernist architecture, but also monographs on artists such as John Piper, Eric Revilius, Enid Marx, and Serge Chamayev. And most relevant to the present day event, um, a relatively recent book that came out last year with Thames and Hudson, fabulous book, which I urge you to read if you haven't yet done so, called rather memorably Bauhaus Goes West, which examines the impact and the legacy of the German Bauhaus, both on America, but particularly on, on this country, which still, to, I think to this day, Alan, I think you probably agree, is remains a, a neglected topic. I mean, last year, as all of you, I'm sure, will know, was the centenary of the founding of the Bauhaus in Weimar. Much was said, much was researched, a lot of information, new information came to light. But nevertheless, the often short-lived, not always that short-lived, but the very, very significant impact that the personnel, as you put it, Alan, of the Bauhaus, those who came to this country, sometimes moved on, sometimes didn't, is an area that repays further scrutiny. And Alan also points out in his uh, introductory blurb that's on the website that um, we're beginning to find out more, aren't we, about um, the internment episode in 1940, um, but the kind of flip side of that, if you like, is the importance of also paying tribute to the immense contribution that those refugees paid, uh, played in the British war effort. And that is Alan's subject today. So without further ado, except for perhaps just one or two practicalities that you probably all know by heart by now, I'll hand over to Alan. But I would very strongly advise you to um, put your screen on speaker view so that it's Alan you concentrate on and nobody else. Um, because of the numbers involved, you probably already know this too, um, we'll invite questions via the chat function, which I will then field to Alan. And um, we've automatically muted everybody, um, I'm afraid, just to keep the noise interference to, to a minimum. So thank you, Alan, over, over to you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, here's the cover of my book, uh, my moment of advertisement. What I'm going to talk about, some of it is in the book and some of it uh, was too circumstantial and too detailed uh, to get in. And I have to confess the several people I should have put into this book who I somehow left out. Uh, one of whom I'm speaking about today, and I've certainly subsequent to publication learnt a lot more, partly through a conference that I organised where speakers um, contributed on um, uh, several of these subjects. Uh, and it was, a, I think, a unique occasion, the amount of coverage we got on the lesser known uh, Bauhäusler uh, in Britain. Uh, that was last November. Um, and since uh, the Insiders Outsiders group was talking about the war period and internment, I thought in a rather contrary way, well, um, how about other things that um, 
some of these people were doing. Now, I don't claim there's any master narrative behind this. Um, they're, they're very random sets of uh, activities and occurrences. I think, as you might expect, in the kind of disturbed condition of the war. Uh, however, if you had been at the Bauhaus, you would have got in there with some skills and come out with quite a lot more and so in a sense it's about how people's skills were used i've actually i realized just to deal with the war period of the figures i'm considering uh, who are only a selection from the possible pool um the war period alone wouldn't make sense without a bit of before and a bit of after so what i've got is a straightforward set of biographical studies um in which the war is Sort of emphasized insofar as we know what happened. Um, so uh, to begin, the, in no particular order, but uh, Lucia Maholi, I think, was probably the oldest in terms of age, uh, and also one of the first to actually arrive in Britain. Um, uh, quite a lot of new research has been done on her uh, recently. I think she's uh, sort of moved into the picture from having been the first wife of, of Laszlo Maholi Naj um, to become a person in her own right and uh, a very interesting one too. Um, very much a self-starter in her early life and career before she meets Laszlo. Uh, I think it's um, fair to say she gave him a great deal of the sort of knowledge and confidence that he then took to the Bauhaus where she joined him, never as an official uh, in the Bauhaus world. She wasn't a teacher, um, she wasn't a student, but she was very much part of it, um, first in Weimar and then in the course of the move to, uh, to Dessau. Um, she started as a photographer with um, no training, uh, but she um, took a course, as you can see, in Leipzig in 1925. And then they split up, I think, relatively amicably. Uh, Laszlo married um, a rather stagey lady called Sybil, um, who uh, was his wife until his rather early death, and with whom he had two daughters. And she wrote uh, a biography of him, uh, which the daughters, or rather um, uh, Hatula, uh, the daughter, says, you know, you shouldn't rely on this biography, it's, it's rather um, romanticized. However, there is um, a, a striking self-portrait from 1930. Um, not very long after coming to Britain, she got this commission from Pelican <coughs> Books to do uh, a Pelican book, which was never reprinted until quite recently. Uh, she had quite good connections, seemingly initially from Paris, uh, particularly from Elizabeth Bibesco, married to a Romanian prince, but in fact Elizabeth Asquith, um, the daughter of the Prime Minister and indeed her uh, formidable mother Margot Asquith, who helped Lucia to get established in London, sure. where she took um, uh, photographs uh, of uh, Margot Asquith and a circle of interesting intellectuals. Um, so uh, those on their own, which are in the National Portrait Gallery, are worthy of exhibition. I can't get Last... sound. And there's somebody I've met and the book I've got. <laughs> Colin, if I can I just interrupt. Sound for some reason. Colin, we can hear you. So if you wouldn't mind um, not talking. Says it should come through on Sony TV. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. It says it's on full volume. The glories of this technology. My apologies, everybody, and Alan in particular. Has that made any difference? Shall I carry on? Oh, yes, well, I think you better carry on. That's what I've just turned yeah. up. I'm not getting yeah. sound at all. Can, Go can on, you move it's possible at this. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yes, she did the book, which was very pioneering in the history of photography no, and is sent to the microphone to listen to him given later uh speakers oh well let me put my get my microphone uh, hold on i just want to talk i just want to, I just want to listen to this guy <laughs> this guy would like to carry on talking is that where you're 
I can't get any sound on. You can mute him. Hold on. Let's see. Yes, I should be able to mute him, shouldn't I? Hold on. Colin Ford. Mute. Remove. Rename. Put in waiting room. Okay. Right, that should do the trick. I've put, I'm afraid I've put Colin in the waiting room. He'll be furious because he wants to hear you, Alan, but do, do, do carry on. Okay, thank you. Um, well, no, uh, this is where the war story begins. Uh, and it's, I think, inherently rather interesting that uh, closing her studio in 1940, uh, Lucia Maholi got into microfilming. Um, because it was recognized that there were scientific documents in um, Germany and other enemy countries or enemy occupied countries that were uh, very important for the war effort. Um, and that these needed to be distributed, uh, particularly in America. Um, and there weren't enough hard copies. Uh, so the answer was to microfilm them. And she uh, developed expertise in microfilming and uh, moved into the position of coordinating the whole program for ASLIB, uh, organization that still exists. Um, and then uh, after the war in 1946, wrote this um, very useful uh, account of um, what she'd done. Uh, it's quite dry stuff, but you know, this is work of, of serious national importance, international importance, and there she was, you know, this um, very good photographer from the Bauhaus, you know, giving up art while she did something important uh, during the war. Um, she went on to do work on archives uh, with UNESCO uh, in 1946. Um, she took British na nationality, um, but I have the impression she wasn't in Britain very much um, before moving to Zurich. Uh, and from there she was a contributor to the Burlington magazine. So from her several contributions, I picked out one on Paul Clay, uh, whom of course she had known at the Bauhaus uh, as a, a colleague. Um, and then I don't know any more about the circumstances, but it's very sad she died um, of injuries from an armed robbery uh, in uh, Zolikon um, in 1989. Um, so that's uh, Lucia Maholi's uh, war effort. Uh, Margaret Leishner um, is getting better known, but uh, there's, it's quite hard to uh, get information or certainly documents uh, about her life and career. Um, she uh, went to the Bauhaus as a weaver. She's quite a lot younger than uh, Lucia. Um, and then she moved on and had a career uh, post Bauhaus uh, as a teacher and as a designer. Um, she wasn't Jewish, but she was seen as um, you know, a suspect person uh, and had been visited by the English weaver Ethel Mary in 1936. So she came on to London. Just here I'm showing you her her Bauhaus uh, identity document um, and one of her pieces, a, a, a slubbed cotton uh, fabric that um, was used on the Bauhaus magazine. Um, she came to Britain in 1938, uh, got work straight away um, and uh, then suffered internment for two years in the women's camp. I'm guessing it's this one in the Isle of Man. I think that must be right. Uh, and here is a quote from um, a pupil of hers, Ruth Hurl, who wrote, uh, I'm sorry about the typing errors, um, done in a certain amount of haste. Um, but uh, she got back into work again immediately afterwards. So she was during the war, you know, working in her own metier, her own profession for, um, the Colour Design and Style Centre in Manchester, and then for Greg's of Scott, Stockport. This is one of uh, the brochures featuring her work. Um, and her speciality was uh, not so much pattern design as 
um, variations of uh, color, texture, fiber uh, in cloth. Um, this, I think, is particularly interesting that she was um, selected for this uh, mission, British Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee. Uh, there's, in fact, a, a book published in German by Anne Sudrow um, going further into uh, the documentation behind this. I got to know about it because I was writing on Enid Marx, who was one of the uh, members of this group, which split up in Germany to go and look at industry and at colleges to see what they were doing. Um, uh, at the end of the war, uh, it was sort of semi-industrial espionage, I suppose. They wanted to pick up useful information on training and on manufacture. They were overall extremely impressed by the uh, way that German industry had already started getting back on its feet. They met, um, uh, I think Marx and Leishner were together and they met um, Georg Mücher, uh, the former Bauhaus teacher who taught uh, textiles in, I think it was in Krefeld. Um, and so uh, I was able to find a cop my own copy of this document uh, online for no very great cost. You can see it's fairly home produced in um, uh, sort of Gestetner um, uh, typed um, reproduction at a cost of 14 shillings, which was quite a lot. Um, at that time, but it, it is a, a fascinating example of how uh, you know, Britain wanted to know about um, uh, Germany. And you can see Dr. N. Pefsner is a member of the group. They wore military uniform. I only wish I could find any photographs of them all, uh, particularly one of Enid Marx and her friend Margaret Lambert. It'd be a wonderful thing. I mean, it was quite tough work. I think the conditions were appalling. You know, everybody was starving uh, and they went round in some discomfort, but with a lot of determination. Uh, but having Leishner as a German speaker would have been a ditto Pesner. And I don't know about Niebuhr, but I imagine he must have been German. Also, Margaret Lambert was very fluent in German. That was her academic subject. Um, some of the things that uh, Leishner did later, this um, range of carpets for an Irish manufacturer, uh, but as I said, there's very little, um, certainly in Britain, to judge her work from. These are some samples that were collected at the Royal Society of Arts, I think by Enid Marx, who was rather a supporter of Leishner's. Um, and these are from Ruth Hurl's uh, obituary, which I think is delightful. Um, uh, Recognising her, she was a tough teacher, evidently, but she had a certain amount of style, her silver jowet javelin with elegant lines and a terrified young man staggering into the design school of the old science museum, having had a lift from Chelsea. She did the journey in three minutes, apparently. Um, whether the Dalmatian was uh, sitting in the back, I'd like to think so. Um, and I love this picture, there are not very many pictures of her, but um, this um, certainly uh, conveys a nice feeling, I think. She died relatively young, actually, in, in her early 60s, uh, but had been uh, awarded the distinction of Royal Designer of in, for Industry. Um, I'm moving on now to Rainer Halkett, who uh, I'm afraid I did leave out, out of my book. Only about a month after publication, I was in Falmouth, walked into the art gallery, and there was a whole exhibition on Rainer Halkett, um, who I should have known about. Um, but I hadn't sort of put the whole story together. Uh, anyway, when the paperback version comes out, as I hope it will, uh, I've managed to squeeze him in. But Halkett is a fascinating character. Um, I think one of several coming from a slightly privileged background in Germany, uh, but because of their generation and the reaction against the First World War, he becomes very left-wing and a rebel. Uh, and um, a bit of a rolling stone, I think one would say, uh, but uh, that was the kind of person who went to the Bauhaus, I think it's uh, true to say in many cases. Um, so here is a, a little resume. He um, moved to Berlin, uh, hung out with interesting people. He'd originally studied stage design, 
uh, which Hein Heckhardt was uh, involved in. Sebastian Hafner um, is uh, an interesting figure as a writer as well, who came to England and wrote about German subjects and then um, returned to Germany. Uh, Halk itself portrait you will have seen because we used it to advertise this event. Um, he worked in a number of styles, you might call them sort of expressionist, abstract and surrealist. So this is him as a, as a surrealist. Uh, in 1930, he um, left Hamburg by, in, in a sort of medium sized sailing boat. It wasn't tiny, but uh, it wasn't exactly a ship either. Uh, they called in at Falmouth. He went ashore and never came back again. And uh, he um, married there, which was his fourth marriage. Um, and then he and his wife went to Ibiza um, uh, for a while, went back to Germany, realized it was no good, and then in 1936 uh, came to England, shared a flat with Heckhardt, uh, and ended up at Dartington, which you'll uh, find repeating in the story of, um, of Naam Slutsky. Uh, this is a rather delightful drawing that was in Marcus Williamson's uh, excellent exhibition at Falmouth um, of, uh, I, I don't know whether this is um, Halkett himself, sort of in a country setting, obviously, leaping over a farm building. Um, he also published an autobiographical book in 1939, uh, which has a very interesting account um, of the Bauhaus as he saw it. And here's a little extract I've taken from him. Um, uh, from it, uh, the sort of questions they were asking about handwork and machine work and um, and so on. There's the cover of the book, very 1950s actually, um, although it's only 1939. Um, here's a quote from Marcus Williamson because it seemed the most concise way of describing his wartime activity. Uh, he didn't get interned, um, he joined the Pioneer Corps and then um, got drafted into essentially secret service uh, operations. Um, I don't know very much about the B black propaganda unit, but um, having been fluent in German was definitely an asset, which then carried on into his um, post-war work uh, with denazification and re-education and also attending the Nuremberg trials. So uh, he was put to good use, I think one would say, um, quick with language. But then what's interesting in the right-hand column, he went on to work for the BBC German service um, with a regular weekly broadcast um, to, to Germany in German. And, and then um, continuing that in his retirement effectively, when he went to Cornwall, uh, he went, must have driven from Camelford to Plymouth or taken a train to, to do a, a letter from Cornwall. And I'd love to read the texts of these, which I assume are in the um, sound archive. And then there's this rather wonderful coda um, to his story, um, which I've uh, here quoted the, the article that goes with this from New Musical Express. Um, he uh, got to hear that there was um, a band called Bauhaus uh he it's, the text is really on the next slide yes uh, he he wrote to john peel the disc jockey um and made contact and um uh, they set his poems um to music which i haven't actually tracked down i'm afraid but anyway everybody was very happy about this bauhaus met bauhaus in 1981 uh, that's one of Halkett's uh, more surreal drawings. He did, did a lot of these. He also made furniture, did sculpture, um, and um, little model houses. He was a sort of genial all-rounder who became a character uh, in Cornwall, but I think, but for this exhibition, would have been quite largely forgotten. Now on to the next subject. Uh, and I'm introducing this in a rather sort of deliberately back to front way. This is uh, the last work 
of John Allenby. Um, and you might look at it and you might see the name and you think, well, what's Barhouse about that? Um, but there is behind this in a um, country church in Oxfordshire, uh, really quite a story. And I'm extremely grateful to um, John Allenby's uh, granddaughter, Jilly, um, who's in the audience uh, for this talk, um, for uh, all the information she's been able to give me. She's uh, been uh, finding out a lot more about the family and is still in the process of, of doing that uh, with the aim of producing a book, which I think will be absolutely fascinating. Um, what he did here was to carve those um, wooden Rudloft figures uh, and uh, paint them, um, which one might think have a slightly German look to them. Also the gilded angels that are on the um, chancel screen below uh, for the architect Lawrence Dale, and I think working very much to his instruction here. Uh, here is uh, a text written by his colleagues at the Oxford School of Art, where he went to teach in 1946. Um, so I'm, as I say, I'm starting at the back end, but this gives a bit of a, um, a resume of his uh, his life, although not revealing his original German name, only the, the English name that he adopted. Um, coming to London in 1936, um, joining the army in 1940, he had already served in the First World War as a teenager, basically, and had a pretty traumatic time of it. Um, his wife had moved to Oxford, which I think accounts for um, how he came to teach there. Uh, as a visiting teacher of sculpture, uh, a friendship radiating through the greater part of the school. Um, and there must be people around who were taught by him. Um, his technical skills, his um, inspiration, sincerity, it's a wonderful tribute really to, to anybody, but particularly uh, in relation to um, you know, what the Bauhaus was able to offer. And my feeling about that um, work in the church is that you know, we're looking for the wrong thing if we're looking for a Bauhaus style. I think what characterizes the Bauhaus, and other people said this, was a, a, an adaptability, a flexibility, um, the skill of meeting a new challenge and knowing how to deal with it, whatever it might be. Um, here's a, a wonderful photo of him as a young man. Uh, here is a few points from his life story, quite complicated. Um, the Auerbach family um, were uh, extremely interesting. His uncle was a um, uh, music expert uh, who uh, had, was a professor in Jena um, and commissioned a house from Walter Gropius because of the nephew um, being by then a, a Bauhaus student. And that house has been very beautifully uh, restored. And I know that some of you in the audience have been there with me on one of my um, ACE cultural tours. Um, and it, it is a wonderful advertisement for what the Gropius as an architect was able to achieve. It's really about the interiors and the colors um, more than what you'd see in a black and white photo of the outside, which is what we normally get. Anyway, back to his uh, story. He's definitely a rebel. Um, finds himself studying in Weimar and then realizes the Bauhaus is the place where he wants to be. So um, uh, he wasn't there very long, um, set up a commune, um, that didn't work, started over again, uh, did the tomb of the extremely interesting person, Karl Ernst Osthaus. I was saying to Jilly, earlier, we, we so need a, an English book on Osthaus, really, really important person from uh, Hagen um, in the, uh, the Royal Valley. Um, here is uh, one of uh, Johannes Auerbach's, alias John Allenby, his um, line cuts, um, uh, very much the Bauhaus expressionist uh, phase. Uh, here is the Osthaus mausoleum, uh, which still exists, which he, he carved, um, which was a great tribute because Osthaus was a great connoisseur and patron 
um, of architects and artists um, in Hagen. Uh, a lovely photograph of him with his son. Um, he moved to Paris, won a sculpture prize, uh, wasn't allowed to have the money. Um, he was very hard up by this time. His wife uh, left him. Uh, he uh, went to Hamburg, was arrested and imprisoned and tortured. It was a very grim episode at the beginning of Nazism. Um, and rather oddly, he, when he married for a second time, uh, it was in Wareham in Dorset, and Julie doesn't quite know why he was there, um, but uh, I expect you'll find out. Uh, he left England, uh, went to the Mediterranean, and then came back in 1939. And this, I think, is an extremely interesting story. I don't know what to make of it. He, you know, he didn't hang around waiting to get interned, which might have happened, but he'd already enlisted in the army. Um, and been sent over to France uh, at uh, the moment when the Germans were invading and was presumably evacuated. And then, um, uh, rather like Halkett, he, he, his value for military intelligence is, is grasped and he is uh, evidently parachuted behind the German lines in 1944, ahead of the invading forces, um, although it's unclear uh, so far uh, what he actually did there. But it's a pretty heroic war record, really, in every respect. Um, I put this in because it's a very familiar scene to me. Um, Hampstead Heath Lake, uh, it's, I, I think we call it a pond, probably. It's one of those with houses backing onto it. Um, he also um, did this tomb for the painter Paul Nash. Uh, which would have been at the beginning of his Oxford period. Paul and Margaret Nash were living in Oxford, so it's not entirely surprising, but still quite surprising. Um, very un-English lettering, um, and indeed the architectural use of those sort of lotus columns is quite strange, but Margaret Nash had been born in Egypt, so I wonder whether that's the, uh, the reason. Her name comes underneath. Uh, I must go and look at it. Um, and this is the catalogue for an exhibition of his sculpture, uh, which was held uh, in Weimar. I'm not sure I've got that date right. I'm sorry, Julie, if I got it wrong. Um, I couldn't, didn't have a way of looking it up. So um, there is a body of his work uh, in Germany, uh, and other pieces are uh, beginning to come to the surface. So I think he deserves a, a, a good showing. Uh, in England as well. I'm now moving on to Naam Slutsky, um, who uh, was also relatively an, an older student when he went to the Bauhaus. Um, he came from a craft background, very high level craft in Kiev. Um, the family moved to Vienna, as you see. Uh, he studied under uh, Johannes Eaton, who was in Vienna before he was recruited, really through his friendship with Alma Mahler, Alma Gropius, um, to go and uh, set up the war course at the Bauhaus. So Slutsky, as an older, experienced student, was both a student and a teacher when he was at the Bauhaus. This uh, was uh, the cause of a certain amount of ambiguity and trouble. But there's a, an early work, of a beautiful piece, which has the sort of geometric purity that we associate with the Bauhaus, but also a sort of hand textured, crafted uh, polity. Um, he went and worked very successfully in uh, Hamburg um, until he realized that you know, the situation was not good. He was pretty quick off the mark coming to England in 1933. Uh, Herbert Reed helped that process because Reed was uh, in very close touch with the director of the um, Applied Art Museum in Hamburg, Max Sauerland. Um, and Reed probably also helped him to get a job with Best and Lloyd. Um, that's another whole story that I'd love to know more about, which is rather lacking documentation. 
um, R.H. Best, uh, who designed the original version of this lamp, still in production, um, and his father, who was a very interesting character, very interested in Germany, sent the son off to study architecture in Germany in the 1920s. So there's a, a strong Anglo-German connection happening there. Um, so back to Slutsky, uh, he gets a job at Dartington, where um, Leonard and Dorothy Elmhurst were welcoming in um, uh, emigres, including the whole of the um, ballet company, the Ballet Jos, uh, and building, putting up special buildings for them. It was an incredibly generous uh, exercise and uh, other um, German emigre artists, sculptors and so on. Um, found a, a shelter at Dartington. Slutsky was interned, but seems to have been released quite quickly, uh, moved to the Lawn Road Flats in Hampstead, uh, to add to the list of Bauhaus associations there, and um, did work for the Chariot Trust Limited. Um, this is really all I can tell you about it, research and production of diamond tools used in optics. Um, during this time, he met Wynne Henderson, who had worked with Peggy Guggenheim, uh, was the mother of uh, Nigel Henderson, the photographer and artist. Um, and also, um, Slutsky taught for a while at Burgess Hill School, Hampstead. I've recently heard from uh, Caroline Compton, the daughter of Fred and Diana Ullman, who went to school there, about uh, Slutsky being uh, her teacher. Um, he then had really quite a successful uh, teaching career in the post-war decades, um, moving between industrial design and craft. Uh, very Bauhaus, you might say, he can do both um, equally successfully. And it was uh, Graham Hughes of the um, Goldsmiths Company who encouraged him to go back to making jewelry uh, for this exhibition very successfully. It was recognized as being both his 1920s jewellery sort of chimed with the uh, aesthetic of the 60s um, in an extraordinary way. Uh, and that's a quote from his obituary in the Times. Now, uh, I've got one more Bauhäusler um, with just one picture and, and a text to go with it. And I'm so cross, I didn't get this picture in my book. I would so love to have had it. Um, maybe it's, it's a little bit absurd. Uh, but there in the middle is Ludwig Hirschfeld Mack, um, who was again an early Bauhäusler uh, in the Weimar period. It's extraordinary how many of them, maybe a generational thing, that was their time there. And uh, he was a stage designer, specialized in lighting and color, and was particularly obsessed by the relationship between color and sound. And while he was in England, from I think about 1936 it was, uh, he um, was working on a, a sort of lifelong project to develop a keyboard instrument that would play colors and sounds at the same time, uh, which he demonstrated uh, at Folkestone, I discovered, rather random piece of information. Um, but uh, having done work at the Peckham Health Center, well-known experimental um, sort of social and medical um, uh, club it was uh, in its constitution in southeast London. Um, he got a job with Dulwich Preparatory School which was evacuated to uh, Cranbrook in Kent and here they are uh, as evacuees within England as it were. Um, this was captioned in the show at uh, Nottingham Contemporary last year as being at the Peckham Health Centre, but it isn't. Uh, I think anybody who knows that site in Peckham would know there's not enough grass there to uh, take a photo like this. But here they are in what seems like a Kentish orchard with speedily run up wooden huts for these boys. Um, I must go on site there sometime and see if it's identifiable. But um, I managed to trace this text uh, about the school uh, during this period when it was um, uh, evacuated. 
Uh, and this is um, what it says about Dr. Hirschfeld, uh, a German refugee um, who also taught music and handwork with us. He had a genius, not only at teaching art and handwork, but also music. He gave us many charming evenings, playing on his accordion with the boys accompanying him on xylophones and zithers, which he had made himself. And here you can see those very things. Um, you know, sort of simple, uh, rather sort of invented instruments. Um, and I hope, I'd like to think that you see at Hirschfeld Mack's feet, there is a board painted with uh, rectangles of different colors. So what I hope this is about is he will hold up the colors and said, and say, now we will play the color blue or, or whatever it might be. And the boys would have to interpret blueness through the um, improvised music. Um, it has to be said, they don't look as though they're having a whole lot of fun, but that may simply be um, self-consciousness in front of the photographer. Um, the small boys adored him, we are told. Um, and he also took over art and handwork at Cranbrook School, the big, um, bigger public school nearby. Uh, I, it's an interesting spelling mistake, not my own in this case, but the original copy says Bauerhaus. Um, and um, the author says he took him into Tunbridge Wells for his tribunal, which he had passed most successfully. Well, whatever that tribunal was, it didn't prevent him being rounded up for internment in the summer of 1940. And he was one of those who were not sent to the Isle of Man or Liverpool, but uh, to Australia on the um, SS Danira, which was an ordeal in itself. Um, uh, Georg or George Telcher Adams was uh, another in the same boat, literally, um, and they were interned at Hay Camp. Um, and um, Hirschfeld Mark didn't return to Britain because in the camp, uh, a local uh, head teacher who was visiting there um, got to know him and uh, recognized his ability as an art teacher and had him released uh, to come and teach art. So he spent the whole of the rest of his career in uh, Melbourne uh, as an art teacher, but did put on a Bauhaus exhibition uh, in the 1960s and his archive is held in Melbourne. Um, so uh, his actual war work perhaps didn't add up to much, but we have this rather delightful photograph to show us uh, what he was doing at the beginning. So that is uh, the end of my um, talk, and we have time now for uh, questions and comments. Wonderful, thank you ever so much, um, Alan. As fully anticipated, that was absolutely fascinating, but also shows how much more there is still to be explored and uh, discovered excavated if that's the word and I do urge anybody who has any further light to throw on any of the fascinating characters that, Ad that Alan has been talking about to either talk up now via the chat option um, or indeed to contact us um, by email through the Insiders Outsiders Festival uh, website but uh, we hope to hear from some of you right now so I have a few comments coming in but in the meantime if anybody would like to type their questions or comments um, through the chat option please do so. Um, Right. Uh, Jeremy uh, saying that the um, Bauhaus Bauhaus collaboration, absolutely delightful, is actually available on YouTube. I don't know, Alan, presumably you were aware of that, but that's for everybody's information. Yes. Um, and what else? Um, right. Rachel Smith. Now, this is a, yes, from the University of Melbourne website. I think this must be to do with Hersfeld Mack. I, uh, mm -hmm. oh, can everybody see it? Um, you, I won't try and read out the website link, but it looks as though there's some interesting information could, there about could, could Rachel tell us about it? Uh, yes, Rachel, do you want to try and unmute? I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. Let me try and find you. I think uh, I can. Oh, you I can. No, very good. Okay, so much. I don't have anything to everybody. particularly more to contribute, apart from looking at the images on that website. I had thought that maybe he had developed some chords that were associated with colours and then there is a picture of him conducting at Peckham where he seems to be holding up colours. So oh. whether it was a system of improvisation based on that colour or 
or using or playing chords based on that colour. I don't know, but that was my impression. Yes. Well, I'll, I must investigate further. It's interesting that Granger comes into that, um, as that's the archive of the composer Percy Granger, uh, who was also interested in mechanical music, as, as some of you may know. He invented the Granger Cross kangaroo free music machine, um, which involved feeding rolls of carpet through um, a piano, I think. Um, uh, I've never heard a recording of it, but he worked on this uh, over many years. Right, let me um, scroll down and see what else is in store. Um, <laughs> right, from Akiko, does Alan have any comment on his background built? Yes, I'm sure you do. Let me just see if there's anything more directly. Uh, ah, here we are. Eva Clark. Is, here's a good oh. one for you, Alan. Have you come across Eva? Delighted to see mention of Ludwig Hischfeldmark, to whom I'm related through marriage. So I guess well, no, you two must be in touch with each other. Absolutely. Uh, Jilly Allenby, who we've uh, heard mention of already. Um, yes, the Albach exhibition um, inspired by the Bauhaus was actually in Weimar 2016, so actually even more recently than you thought. And please keep the comments coming. And then, yes, all right, why don't you say something about the background image? That's right. Well, this is the um, Oscar Schlemmer picture. I realise it's actually flipped. Um, it, I, should, I can mirror image it back the other way, uh, I think, if I'm clever about it. Uh, that's better. That's how we're used to seeing it. Um, of the students on the stairs at the Bauhaus, uh, this is extremely well known partly because it entered the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, in 1938, when they did the Bauhaus exhibition. And the story behind that is that um, uh, Philip Johnson, who was the first curator of architecture and design, later a famous architect, had been in Germany in 1933 when Schlemmer exhibited this was it 32 I forget 32 perhaps and um, I went to a, an exhibition in Stuttgart where it was shown where the gallery had been shut by the Nazis um, and he insisted on getting into it and he bought the painting and it got back to the States and and he said he was buying it to sort of I, I can't really quote it's 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 an impolite quote but, um, he wanted to show the Nazis that you know, he, he supported this movement. So uh, it is. it was painted sort of when it was all over. I think this is the poignant thing. It wasn't a reportage. This was a, a reminiscence of something that uh, Schlemmer knew by then, you know, was over. Uh, it would not happen again in his time. Thank you for, <laughs> for that. Fine. Let me just see if there's anything else coming up. Yeah. Whoop. Ah. Um, Alan, you mentioned Dartington several times. And it absolutely confirms my conviction that, again, there is a huge amount of rewarding research to be done there. It astonishes me that nobody's actually looked in any kind of concerted and detailed way at the role of Dartington in the 1930s. And I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that more generally. It's something actually I'd love to plan an event maybe in the autumn, Alan, we can discuss you know, the possibility oh, yes, of focusing yes. specifically well, on Dartington. But in the meantime, maybe you have something to, you'd like to add? Yeah, well, um, I suspect this is a, an audience that knows quite a lot about it already. Mm -hmm. but, um, Dorothy Elmhurst was one of the richest women in America uh, because she had inherited the Whitney fortune. Um, uh, and... Uh, her first husband died young. Uh, she had three children. Um, she was courted by an English um, idealist, Leonard Elmhurst, and finally agreed to marry him. And they went on and had several more children. And they had a shared project. This is really what sort of brought the marriage together. Inspired by Rabindranath Tagore, uh, which takes us actually on a very interesting Bauhaus excursion. Some of you may know uh, the relatively recently rediscovered evidence of a Bauhaus exhibition held in Calcutta in 1920, was it 20 or 21, um, which was really to do with Tagore's network in Bengal. 
uh, and uh, the Austrian art historian Stella Kramrisch, who had been in London, and then she went out to work with Tagore, who was a friend of William Rothenstein, and because of her uh, knowledge of Johannes Itten, she caused this Bauhaus exhibition to take place in Calcutta, which was the first Bauhaus exhibition in an English-speaking country. Um, only of works on paper, but still there it was. Uh, so Tagore um, was really particularly Leonard Elmhurst's mentor. The idea that um, you know the purpose of life was to uh, create regeneration, in this case in a um, rural area in Devon. Um, they went searching for a place to do this. They found Dartington with a beautiful medieval manor house where the big hall had lost its roof, um, an estate that had run down, and it was perfect. Uh, so they set to to um, repair the buildings, put up new ones, um, created a school for their own children initially, and then it expanded um, on you know, very progressive educational principles. Then it was very ad hoc at the beginning. Um, and they could simply afford to make experiments to bring people in. But it was very much also involved with uh, engaging the community, the people who worked on the estate or lived locally could take part in dance or music. Crafts uh, were very important. They set up a weaving mill and brought Bernard Leach to start a pottery and um, people sort of drifted in and out of Dartington. It was the way it was. I met a man there who had become the archivist by the 1980s, but he, I said, how did you get here? He said, oh, somebody said, you should go down there, it's rather a good bar. Uh, he'd sort of arrived there and stayed ever since. Um, and uh, subsequently, um, it's sort of bits of it have dropped off. One should say physically, it's all still there and the gardens are beautifully kept but there's not so much um, activity. Uh, Schumacher College is, is really the main thing that's happening there, uh, which I think is very good, but uh, there's not the range that there was. But there is this fascinating moment, I mean, connecting with this bigger story that we've been looking at, you know, where not only the Ballet Jusse, um and Rudolf Laban was there, I think, wasn't he, uh, for a while, but, you know, the various characters you've touched on, but also sculptor Vili Sukop, for example, you know, it was a place of sanctuary. Um, quite significantly until the British government actually ordered all the emigres to come away from the coast. I think that was right, wasn't it, at the time of the threat of invasion. So I think there's, there's a, a rich story to be told there. Well, it certainly is, yes. Mm. Mm. Any now, I had, I think there's a specific um, question about, um, yes, from, hold on, um, from Roger Ashton Griffiths, um, the print The Flowers uh, by Baubach, by Allenby, um, from 1919, is reminiscent of Wyndham Lewis's images. How close were the, were there any connections with the vortices is essentially the question. Hmm. Uh, I suspect not. Not, yeah. Um, because the vortices are essentially a sort of outstation of mainland Europe, uh, a very interesting one, admittedly. But I think, I think they're parallel streams, not, not um, streams crossing. I doubt if anybody in Germany knew anything at all about the vortices that day. Right, I'm sure there must be more questions and comments. People are mulling things over. Uh, perhaps while I give you one last chance indeed to type um, your contributions in, I could just tie a few threads together. I mean, one of the things I personally have found entirely and in an ongoing way fascinating about the whole Insiders Outsiders project is the manifold connections and unexpected interactions and connections between people and that's I think evident even from your short talk Alan so if I could just sort of bring a few things together. Um, Lucia Moholi is clearly a force to be reckoned with beginning to be rediscovered I think quite you know thank goodness um, but there is an exhibition that has just recently reopened I'm pleased to say at the Four Corners Gallery called Another Eye which is a group exhibition but which examines the extraordinary phenomenon of a quite significant number of women refugee photographers who came to this country and contributed and achieved in their various ways. So do look out for that. And there's actually going to be a conference which will include quite a lot of uh, 
coverage of Lucia Moholy in mid-September. So if you look on the another, sorry, the Four Corners website, you will see, find information both about the exhibition and the conference, if you would like to pursue that. Um, you mentioned that uh, uh, Leichner was probably in Russian. Russian, as you may or may not know, was the women's camp, um, the south of the um, Isle of Man. Interesting subject. We're hoping in the autumn to have a whole talk by somebody from the Isle of Man, specifically looking at the female internees, which is a less familiar story than that of the experience of the male internees. Um, you mentioned black propaganda. Um, I pricked up my ears because I think I'm right in saying that Elizabeth Friedlander, who some of you may know, as a really very important but entirely Un understudied um, graphic designer and typographer, the Elizabeth typeface, some of you may have come across, also worked in black propaganda during the war, so that's something to look out for. Um, you mentioned, I think also, I think I've got this right, that Slutsky was a friend of the notorious and fascinating Alma Mahler. Uh, another connection there with a very poignant event that's scheduled to take place this very Thursday, looking at Alma Rosé, who was a violinist, successful young violinist, ended up playing in the Women's Orchestra in Auschwitz, can you even begin to believe that, but who was called Alma because her father was Arnold, a very, very high-flying violinist who's actually married to the sister of Gustav Mahler. So there are all these, you know, fantastic and fascinating connections. What else? Um, I think that's probably enough for the moment. Um, now I have, yes, there are a few more, hold on, a few more comments coming through. Um, thank you from Anna Gordon. Uh, Jilly Allenby again, the print is one of a series of 12 which were published at the Folkwang Verlag. Several came up at auction in Berlin recently. Interesting. Uh, Eva Clark, okay. Um, yes, Hitchfield might also taught art in South Wales. I wonder if you were aware of that, Alan. Interesting. Um, no, I think is the answer. <laughs> I have got the book on him. Uh, and uh, if I'd read it, I'm afraid it had slipped out of my mind. Was it for minors? Was it a sort of relief effort for the minors? Eva, you're very welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like to chip in at this point. Um, <laughs> I can't remember the precise details now. I also have the book. Are you talking about the, the catalogue of his exhibition that was held in, in, Fra in, Ham no, in Frankfurt? No, in Hamburg? Yes, I've got the Italian edition. You've got the Italian. I've got... Well, my Italian's better than my German. Well, my German's non-existent. But um, I, I, I said to his... Uh, grandson at the time uh, I said it really should be published in English you'd have a much bigger mm. market because they wanted to bring that whole exhibition to London mm. and I said until you have a an English catalogue it won't work yeah uh, but it's a great shame um, and uh, yeah I'm very honored I do have one of his works I also have one of his etchings that he did in the internment camp in um, Australia Yes. Uh, the, the exhibition in Nottingham that I mentioned had some um, reproductions of the instruments on show, right. Right. Uh, which uh, was fascinating. And also I photographed it on the wall, a sort of specification for how to make them, uh -huh. um, which uh, I, I shall try and pursue. And Did any, does anybody rem remember the Barrow Poets, very 1960s, 70s? Yeah. Well, um, uh, I think it was Jim Parker who, who played this thing called the bass caco fiddle. Remember that? Which was a sort of double bass, um, but a homemade one, which looks very like a Hirschfeld Mack instrument. And I assume you also know that he, um, he invented, designed the, the multicolored um, spinning top. No. Oh. Yeah, the children's toy. Mm. Yeah. And there is one. There is one piece of his work in the British Museum, because I know. Um, I know uh, my son took Hirschfeld Mack's daughter Margaret, who used to live in London, um, to see it, some time before she died a few years ago. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for that. Can I, um, with this particular um, company, make an appeal for? Uh, a future project of mine uh, coming later this year. Um, toys brought it to my mind. Uh, it's about Paul and Marjorie Abbott yeah. toys. Yeah. Um, which, some of which are easy to find and some of them incredibly difficult. We're trying to put on an exhibition at Margaret Howells in Wigmore Street 
Uh, and if anybody either has or knows of the whereabouts of Abbott toys, uh, do please get in touch um, because I'm putting feelers out and I feel this is a, 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 a good field in which to be looking. That's really interesting to know, Alan, because it's occurred to me for some time now that there's a bigger subject that, again, would repay further scrutiny, and that is the contribution, not just of the emigres, but those who are associated with them, like the abbots, um, to that whole realm of childhood, whether it's in psychology, art therapy, uh, toy design. I mean, fascinating subject. I'm going to put you in touch with um, Deborah Jaffe, who's written a whole history I, of I toy. Know Do you know Deborah in that case? Uh, but, but. <laughs> Very good. Good to know. Now, I think there's another comment from Rachel here, um, Rachel Smith. Um, I tried to trace his work. Uh, I guess we're talking about Hirschfeld Mack again, uh, and make contact with Rose Morris and Co Music Company, but got nowhere, no archives to see, apparently. Can I, can I just say something to Rachel? Um, Rachel, I know that um, Ludwig's uh, grandson, uh, Chris Bell, who lives in uh, Australia, uh, he is in, in the process of compiling a book about his grandfather. Um, and if I can be of any help or if I can give you contacts or perhaps you already know about him, I don't know. Thank you from, from Rachel, actually, everybody can see this. Are there any? Okay, last chance to uh, have your say. I must ask you, Eva, Eva, do, do contact, if you email me, you know, use the generic, the Insiders Outsiders website and that'll come through to me and then I can put you in touch with, with Alan with great, great pleasure. Is um, the Chris Bell you just mentioned by any chance related to Leonard Bell? Have you come across no, Leonard? No. Because he's just written, or fairly recently wrote a very interesting book about the emigre's contribution to New Zealand culture. So I just wondered if per chance there was a connection there. No, no, Chris Bell is the grandfather, uh, the grandson on, um, of Ludwig. I just wondered if there was another unexpected connection. Uh, Marilyn Green um, saying, just check, there are two prints by Mac in the British Museum. Oh, so yes, very good. Okay. Great. Last chance, everybody. All right, well, there's clearly a great deal more that could be said and much to be explored. So perhaps we should leave it on that sort of tantalizing note. I do remember one last thing I just wanted to um, add, and that is that the Isocon, the wonderful display in the former garage of the Isocon building in Hampstead near the Royal Free Hospital, has just reopened to the public, um, not before time, of course, but because of the virus. And there's a very fascinating, as well as there's, you know, there's a permanent display about the whole fascinating history of the building, which of course includes Slutsky and many other Hoysler's besides the better known ones who went off to the States afterwards. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so look, look out for that as well. It's recently reopened and uh, well, worth, well worth a visit if you don't already know about it. Right, I think we've probably come to an end. It will give those of you who are planning to join us for the next Raiman Schula, Raiman School event at 6.30, time to stretch legs, have a cup of tea, <laughs> relax a little bit <laughs> before logging in again. Thank you very much indeed, Alan, that was tremendous. And thank you everybody for uh, being such an engaged audience. All the very best and good night. Thank you. <laughs>